A couple weeks ago, Sandra and I were talking uh, about all of the, the, the young people in, in our country who are currently having to, to miss school, right? We were doing that thing that you do during this pandemic where you pick a difficult thing that is pretty much out of your control and you just talk about how terrible it is uh, and, you know, somehow think that's going to make you feel better in the end. Of, so, so we were talking about how these young people have to miss school and that's so unfair to them for so many reasons. And one of the things that, that I sort of just came out of my mouth and I was almost surprised to hear myself say it was, and now they won't be able to eat in the cafeteria and they won't get to complain about cafeteria food, uh, right? Uh, because I, I feel like school cafeteria food uh, is one of the truly unifying American experiences, right? It's something we all can relate to in some way. Even if we didn't eat it, we were probably around it or at least aware of it. And every person uh, from, from every generation can tell you a cafeteria food story, right? My, my dad, who is a baby boomer, will talk about chipped beef on toast. Uh, a, a Gen Xer told me uh, that his cafeteria food was, was uh, he said, picture pizza that was the size, shape, and flavor of a roofing shingle. Uh, and I, you know, as a millennial, can wax poetic about bologna sandwiches on white bread with neon orange American cheese all wrapped up in, in saran wrap. I, I was from that, that first generation where they were trying to make cafeteria food healthy, right? So like you couldn't have Pepsi, but you had Fruitopia and you know, Doritos became Andy Capp's hot fries. Uh, and, and you know, it was, it was healthy, not up to the Michelle Obama standard, but uh, it was healthy and still I was able to have something on my tray at least every day that was uh, neon orange. And you know, it's, it's this culturally unifying thing, right? Half of the millennials watching this service had, had a visceral, had, had a physical reaction when I mentioned Andy Capp's hot fries. And so many of our memories as, as individuals and as communities are built around meals. Right, Thanksgiving, Christmas dinner, Passover, Iftar. Coming together for a meal with the people you love is something that we all value. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Last Supper is such an iconic moment in the Bible, right? Not only because of what it means to our Christian friends theologically, but I think it's also, it's a situation that we can relate to, right? We see this group of friends sitting around this table together, and even 2,000 years later, we can connect with it. In the story, Jesus and his friends gather together for Passover, and they eat this meal together, and during the meal, Jesus breaks the bread, and later he pours the wine, and he says they are his body and his blood, and to eat and drink and do this in memory of him, there is a staggering amount of theology that has been written over the years about what exactly he means when he says this. My wife has dedicated much of her ministerial career to exploring that question. And that question is worth exploring, but I think it's also worth looking at the meal itself, right? Before and after Jesus says these famous words about the bread and the wine, because we have these people who are there, they're sharing this meal, and in just a few hours, Jesus is going to get arrested and executed, and the apostles are going to scatter and hide, and Peter will break his commitments. And then even after Jesus is resurrected and he and Peter are reconciled, the apostles will all face hardships for the rest of their lives. And a lot of their lives end violently. But right then, just for a few minutes, right before everything starts to go wrong, they get to sit and have this meal together. And I imagine the apostles remembering this meal as being one of the best that they ever had. Memory is 
it is different from history in that way. The Last Supper isn't really about history as as Jesus says, it's about, memor- it's about memory. And the distinction between history and memory uh, gets more complicated and more difficult the more you think about it. It's something that I think we humans have trouble with. We struggle to make that distinction more, more than we realize that we do. Um, the example that I've come up with uh, as to the difference between history and, and, and memory is this, this story. Uh, after Sandra and I had our conversation about middle school lunches, you know, I started feeling super nostalgic for that period of my life in general, and you know, I didn't have a lot to do what, with the quarantine and all, so I went on eBay and ordered a box of old issues of the comic book magazines that I used to read because You know, when I was that age, I achieved a level of geekdom where I not only read comic books, I then read magazines about comic books. And eBay said that the magazines may have some writing in them, but that's not what I got. What I got was a collection of magazines that had been fully illuminated, like like a medieval manuscript. This person had written and drawn all over every page. There was commentary about the articles. There was what I guess we might call the sort of philosophy about life in general. They blacked out some of the paragraphs with Sharpies. They sometimes in the illustration, they put white out over the characters' faces and redrew the faces themselves. It was was next level strange and a lot of it was rather dark. Uh, the magazines looked like something you would find in somebody's home after they had been convicted of a horrible crime. Uh, I couldn't decide if I was more fascinated or disturbed, but I was clearly looking at a window into somebody else's private world. Right? I, I cannot imagine that the owner of these magazines ever you know, thought that anybody else was ever going to see them. And this is what memory is like. Right? If, if history is what the magazine actually says, memory is what happens when we look at that history through all of our own additions and illuminations that are created by our own emotions and biases and neuroses. Memory is about your inner world, what you notice, what you internalize, how you were affected by what you noticed and what you did not notice. So when we talk about the story of Jesus and the Last Supper and the following 48 hours, we're talking about this group of young people all hanging out together, and we're talking about what it meant for them to experience the things that they did immediately after their meal. We are telling the story of what they saw, what they noticed, how it made them feel, and how their knowledge of these events was shaped by their experiences of them and how this affected the rest of their lives. You know, I think about Peter. You know, Peter on the road preaching and teaching people about, you know, this this new Jewish sect called Christianity. And, you know, he spent a lot of time staying in people's houses, and I picture him hanging out at someone's house, and that person pouring him a glass of wine, and he watches them do it, and he doesn't say anything. But he thinks about that night when he watched his teacher pour him a glass of wine, right? Before his teacher was arrested and killed. I think about John, who was the youngest of the apostles. At the time of the Last Supper, John was probably about the age that I was when I was eating Andy Capp's hot fries, right? John was probably in his early to mid-teens. John, who lived for 60 years after Jesus died. So, you know, you think about John at the end of his life as the last living person who was in the room during the Last Supper. I think about John seeing groups of young people eating and drinking together just like him and his friends so long ago and remembering how scared he was that night. 
thinking about how he still has nightmares about that night and thinking about he still has so much love for his old crew. Peter and John and all of the apostles lived the rest of their lives remembering how they felt in that moment. And those feelings and those memories guided their decisions at least as much as the factual history that they knew about the events of that night and the day after. And it's interesting then. Jesus says, do this and remember me. Right? He, he does not say, do this and memorize every detail of what is happening right now. He says, remember me. Relate to me. Internalize what it means to you for me to have been in your life. And to our Christian kindred, you know, they might interpret that as Jesus saying to have him in your life as God. And that might be what it means to some of us as Unitarian Universalists, but it doesn't have to be what it means, right? This can also be a story about a very wise man talking to his friends and his students and saying, remember your friend and your teacher who led you around and taught you and reprimanded you and served you bread and wine on the last night of his life. So if you want to understand who the apostles were, and why they did the things that they did, you would need to know about what they remembered. Not just the facts of what happened to them, not just the words laid out on the page, but the added layers, the drawings and the notes and the illuminations that they created in their minds over the course of the rest of their lives. There has been a lot of talk lately in our country and in our world about unity and coming together. President Biden talked about it in his inaugural speech. Politicians have been bellowing about it in Washington, and I think most of them are at least kind of sincere. There is a genuine desire, there is a hunger in our country and in our communities we want to be able to come together. We want to be able to sit and eat together at the cafeteria table of kinship once, once more and to heal the divisions of this bitterly divisive era. And along with these calls for unity, we are also hearing many calls for accountability, right? And for the people who are responsible for the pain and division of the last few months and years, to be punished, and right because the problem with calls for unity is that they can turn into calls for leniency without accountability. And the problem with calls for accountability is that they can turn into calls for blood. But before we start debating about unity and accountability after what has happened in our country over the last four years and beyond, you, you know, you'd think we have to agree on what exactly did happen over the last four years and beyond, and that is proving to be difficult. We Americans seem to have lost our already tenuous grip on what is or is not factual. So what do we do? The answer, I believe, is we share our memories. We need to be able to see and hear each other, not just the realities of what happened, but the way that the events that transpired impacted us and the people we love and are continuing to do so. If we cannot get to a consensus on this is how it was, I believe we can come to a consensus on this is how I felt. And that may be different from how you felt, but we can agree that we both really did feel that way. This past week, I watched an Instagram Live video where Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez shared her experiences of what it was like to live through the invasion of the United States Capitol. And she described the fear that she felt and the trauma that she endured. And she is not the only traumatized person 
because of that event or because of the era of violence and illness that we are living through. It has managed to, I think at this point, traumatize basically all of us in one way or another. We are all having this moment that is not so very different from what the apostles experienced when all that they knew to be good and secure in the world was taken away and violated horribly. And if all of us are so traumatized by what we have experienced, if all of us are swimming in the memories that we are carrying around of this massive cultural trauma, then whatever unity we want to create must account for that trauma. Part of what needs to happen in our world now is, is about logistics, right? It, it's vaccines, it's tests, it's, it's organization. But part of it is also about catharsis, right? We, we Americans have never been particularly good at reporting the facts as they happened. And so I, I don't think we should bank on us suddenly being able to do that now and having that be the thing that saves us. What we are good at, or at least what we were once good at, is expressing what we remember and how we feel, telling our stories and hearing and honoring each other's stories, right? This is why we love stories about cafeteria food. It's why they are so unifying, because they are stories about feelings and memories. Cafeteria food was not as good or as bad as we remember it as being but we can tell you how it made us feel. And we believe each other. And this is basically our task now. We are, all of us, walking around carrying so much hurt, like the apostles were after the Last Supper. And the solution is not to dig in our heels. The solution is to come back to the table. The solution is to look at this story of friends coming together and eating together and sharing their experiences and to let that be what guides us forward. And this is the work of religious communities in our time. Even if we cannot meet in person, we are still able to connect with each other. Our role is still to provide a space, a, a place, whether that place is physical or not, where we can bring our memories a place where we can bring our trauma and our joy and our celebrations and our grief and where we can hear from and learn from each other. This is what we can give to ourselves and ultimately what we can give to our world. Amen.